Sue is a graduate of the University of New Hampshire and has been a registered occupational therapist since 1979. Her career has included work in rehab settings, acute care hospitals, burn units, and private practice. After moving to California in 1985, she specialized in hand therapy, became a certified hand therapist in 1994, and has been treating hand injuries in the Bay Area for over 25 years. Sue joined Stanford Hospital and Clinics in 2006. Sue is a member of the American Society of Hand Therapists and has been active in the ASHT California chapter since its inception, serving as treasurer and vice president and now serving on the board of directors. Uh, on the board as Director of Education. Lou Brooke, Lou graduated from Texas Women's University in 1982 and has been practicing hand therapy in California for over 20 years. Prior to her move to California, she, pa she practiced in both Florida and Texas. She has treated patients with various diagnoses involving the upper extremity, but particularly enjoys providing therapy for those with tendon and nerve injuries, replantations and amputations, and fractures. Like her colleagues, she is a member of the a ASHT and the California chapter and enjoys networking with other hand therapists to discuss new and, new and evolving treatment procedures and protocols. Please welcome Susan and Lou. Thank you. Okay, this is going to be interesting. First of all, <clears throat> I hate to following Dr. Chang. He's a wonderful speaker, a wonderful surgeon, and we both have the opportunity to work with him on uh, pretty much a daily basis, and we see a lot of his patients. We are the Lou and Sue team. We do team up on a lot of patients. Um, we're going to try to kind of go back and forth with our slides. Having two speakers is... Eh, it'll be fun, but it, and we want your interaction because I kind of feel like I'm preaching to the choir that you all know a lot about caring for your hands and you can be teaching us as we teach you. Can I interrupt for a second? Yes. And could we have a show of hands of how many of you have received hand therapy or some form of physical therapy related to your scleroderma? Okay, so more than 50%. That's the preaching to the choir part. <laughs> so here we are. Um, I borrowed a computer. So hand anatomy, you probably know most of the hand anatomy, um, but we will talk about your DIP joint, which is the very tip joint. Actually, Lou, maybe you just show on your hand, or how do sure. you want to do it? Yeah. And then there's the PIP joint. That's the joint that many of you suffer with because you're in a, that contracted position, and it's the joint that sticks out on you. And then there's the MP joint, which are the bigger joints of the hand. Those are the ones we want to make sure we keep flexible. Dr. Chang was talking about that they confuse the PIP joints. Some people lose their DIP, but it's the MP joints we want to keep flexible. And then, of course, there's the all-important thumb. And we always want to keep our opposable thumb, and that's what makes us all so functional. So we talk a lot about digits, but let's also not forget how important the thumb is. Want to do this one? Okay, okay sure. So how does scleroderma affect your hands? Well, we know it causes diffuse swelling, tightness of the skin, joint stiffness, extreme dryness, pain, poor circulation, calcinosis, and skin ulcerations. The skin tightness causes that in what we call in therapy the intrinsic minus position, which is... We'll get to that slide. We're going to get to that yeah. one. Later. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we will. So go on. Okay, and so how do we control your swelling? Well, there's a number of various ways. Uh, we use isotoner gloves in our clinics. Are most of you familiar with those gloves? We have a sample. We have tipless, and we also have gloves that ex extend the full length of the finger. And that helps. That's, that uh, compression helps with the edema. Um, but we want to avoid that compression if you've had surgery. Uh, Dr. Chang doesn't really like us to wrap the extremity very tightly after the surgery. You guys all know these, right? Reduce salt intake, um, elevate the extremity for the edema and the swelling. Retrograde massage is a form of massage where we sort of milk each finger from the tip of the finger down to the base to help with um, the heart recirculating re the, the swelling, if you will. And then contrast baths, which is a combination of immersing your hand in both warm water then cold water, back and forth for about six to, eight, six to eight minutes, one minute each. But of course, we don't want to advise you, that advise you to put any ice in the cold water because of the Renauds, so. 
People are afraid of contrast baths because they think it has to be really steamy water and icy water. It just needs a 25 to 30 degrees difference. So right. you can be in 96 to 100 degrees and then just immerse in, in the 60s, which is tap water, uh, room temperature cool. So it doesn't have to be an icy bath and it can really help with your swelling. Uh, topical agents, you want to make sure you condition your skin well. I'm sure you have all tried wonderful topical agents. Um, we use a lot of cocoa butter in our clinic, um, and I like it, although I smell like cocoa the rest of the mm -hmm. day. So um, I've been using a lot of Eucerin products, Aquaphor, and they seem to be working very well. Um, Lanolin-based products are um, advisable. Um, to condition your skin, just hydration too. I happen to live in the high desert, so I know how important it is for me to drink a lot of water or my skin gets very dry. And um, also just paraffin baths. We'll be talking about paraffin baths later because we use that for heat as well. But there is oil in the paraffin, and that oil is what conditions your skin. And one thing I kind of forgot when I was doing this slide is that uh, I know hot showers feel good when you have scleroderma, but showering frequently also dries out your skin skin. So for those of us who have really dry skin, sometimes it's advisable not to shower every day. Did you have a question? Yes, the mineral oil is impregnated in the paraffin when you buy that unit. Um, and I think I had one patient who felt like he wanted a little bit more oil and just put some drops of mineral oil in. Um, and you can buy additional paraffin. And we'll go through that later because I gave you a catalog that has all this wonderful stuff. And the oil, excuse me, the paraffin refills in that catalog are better than what you can buy at Bed Bath & Beyond because I believe they do have a little more oil. And they also have a little scent, which makes it a little, a little more pleasing. You got it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Circulation. Oh, I have Renaud's. Um, I uh, unfortunately have Renaud's disease, so it's not related to scleroderma, but I know it quite well. Um, I've had it for the past 30 years. So as you all know, Renaud's phenomena is associated with scleroderma, and uh, secondary Renaud's phenomena is associated with connective tissue disease. Nerves and muscles controlling the blood vessels become sensitive and overreactive, as Dr. Cheng mentioned earlier this morning. Blanching of one or more of the fingers, then as the oxygen is deprived, which is called cyanosis, the finger turns blue, and then followed by a rubor or reddening of the skin as the blood flow returns to the digits. It's often painful, tingling associated with this, and often cold or stress-induced. Okay, and circulation techniques in aiding the blood flow, well, as we mentioned earlier, the paraffin baths with the mineral oil, heating pads or microwavable mitts, contrast baths, avoiding the extreme temperatures, gloves, um, we always have gloves available in our, clinical, in our clinic situation to fit, use, um, use for air conditioning buildings, cut the fingertips off to allow for prehension so that you still have some sensory input, Wear socks and cotton gloves to bed at night. And consider the glove inserts or the packs that you can get heat from that skiers often use in the cold weather. Wear layers of clothing. Keep your core and your trunk warm. This is vital. And include hats and scarves to retain body heat. And you notice the picture of the gloves. Those are the ones with the little digital things that you can still use your cell phone. And they're pretty inexpensive. I don't know if you've tried them, but um, my kids use them and they work well. And so the one thing, you know, as your skin is tightening, um, your digits are going to tight, and you've just got to really maintain your mobility. And I know it's a struggle. You're not feeling well. You're worried about ulcers. We're going to talk about prevention later but for um, ulcerations and how to protect your skin. But to prevent tightness, you've just got to keep moving. And we're going to go through some of the exercises, the positioning. Um, I put in compliance with medications because in speaking with a couple of my patients while I was putting this talk together, one of them said he regrets not going on the higher dose of medication that was recommended for him because he feels it might have kept his skin a little softer and might have kept his hands from tightening so much. So I threw in compliance with medications for preventing tightness in your extremities. 
Um, use splints. Uh, the, the word that we have all used for many, many years is splints. The word is changing now. Medicare and uh, CMS and all wants us to use the word orthotic, but um, we, uh, you'll see splint and or orthotic mentioned in this talk. So it's all one and the same. It's just different nomenclature. Um, and you use those to counteract the deforming forces. Again, better to use those sooner than later. And then just to stay as active as you can. How many of you have splints or have ever been treated with splints? I've seen a few on fingers today. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There you go. There's your intern. Oh. I'm sorry? Are there different ones for day and night? Yes, there can yes, be. There yeah, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the hand positioning, well, the, the potential deforming position um, is that intrinsic minus position where we get hyperextension of the empty joints here and then clawing of these other two joints, the PIPs and the DIPs. It can also cause um, limited wrist range of motion as well, thumb web shortening, which interferes with opposition, your ability to pick up uh, small objects. And then, then the PIPs are then more exposed and likely to uh, be susceptible to skin breakdown um, and uh, ulcers. Now, this is a picture of one of my patients. He actually ha does not have that intrinsic minus position. He actually has um, just a lot of extrinsic tightness, and this is his fist. And this is the guy who said to me he wishes he'd been a little more compliant over the years. So uh, not to scare you, but to say keep yourselves moving and keep yourselves in good position. He, his wrists are pretty much autofused, but he felt that that happened very quickly, almost overnight, with um, some diffuse swelling from the scleroderma. Oh, so the hand positioning with the splints or the orthosis as we now call them. Um, we place the hand in what's called the intrinsic plus position, which is just the opposite of, of the deforming position. So the MP joints are placed in maximum flexion and the PIP and the DIPs are placed in maximum extension. And the thumb is often included to open up that web space and get into a more functional position. Um, it's used to improve and limit the contractures and also for protection of the hand. Very often these splints are used at night as opposed to day because they really limit your ability to use your hand in a normal fashion. So. The web space? Well, the web space refer to, for the most part, around the, wet, around the thumb here where this can shorten from tightening of the skin and also in between the fingers. So many of you probably note that you have difficulty spreading your fingers white, uh, wide and that is because of the web space contractures. And we'll talk a little bit about that, some of the exercises that you can do to help with that later on. Okay. You wrote this slide. You oh, <laughs> so exercise tips, um, range of motion exercises include active, passive, stretching with 15 to 30 second holds, then strengthening and conditioning. Um, those kinds of exercises in, are included are therapeutic exercises, which is a, a putty that we teach you manipulatory exercises with for strengthening. TheraBand or sports tube exercises, you've probably seen people at the gym doing this as well. They're elasticated bands that you can do resistive training with. Uh, light weights or dumbbells. Uh, swimming or pool aerobics. Walking, hiking, yoga and Pilates. And, and I would say if you're doing yoga and Pilates, a more gentle form of right. yoga and, and Pilates. And not a lot of the weight bearing yeah. in the hand position. Don't stress is. your hands, yeah. but keep your hands active and mobile. So range of motion of the hand. We have a lot of exercises. That's the one handout I went ahead and had Jamie um, give you. It's our handout that we give our patients on just digital range of motion exercises. You would want to maybe go over these with your therapist, but none of these exercises will harm you. They're all meant for mobility. And tendon gliding exercises, which is the... Um, illustration on the far right of that screen are getting your digits in all positions to stress each tendon. So you're starting with straight fingers, you're going to, um, oh that's an interesting tendon glide because it goes to an MP flexion, I often don't do that, then a flat fist, a hook fist, and a full fist. The handout shows you going from straight finger to hook, straight finger to flat, straight finger to fist. 
I, I don't think it has to be in any specific order. I used to teach it just having people come into a flat fist and roll up to a full fist and then up to a hook fist. But you're trying to get those joints in all the positions because of the, the architecture of the tendons and making sure they stay stretched out. And then, you know, you want to do some finger strumming on the table. You want to have each finger move individually. You want to do some intrinsic stretches, which is getting into this position. Now, I know that's the position that some of you are kind of stuck in, but um, you want to get that hand down kind of on a table and just push a little bit so that your intrinsics don't get too tight. Um, and then finger web uh, stretches, and you can do that. Oh, excuse me, I missed opposition. Opposition is an use of the thumb to bring it around. And you want to get to each finger, and you want to keep that thumb really mobile. And then finger web stretches. We just showed a clasped hand so that you can stretch the webs of all your fingers. But you can also do a little pull on your thumb to stretch the thumb web space. And that pull would need to happen from the base of your thumb, not the tip of your thumb. If you pull on the tip, you're just going to hyperextend this top joint. So you want to pull from the base of your thumb and do a really nice stretch. Okay. And another good web stra uh, stretch for the thumb is also just pinching that web space between your thumb and your index and holding it. It's also a pressure point for headache release. You're probably familiar with that as well. <laughs> so that's a good stretch. Some people even put a, a, a clothespin, a, a padded clothespin, and it feels pretty good. Okay, so facial and body exercises. Um, I know we're all hand therapists, but we wanted to emphasize the importance of continuing to do this as well. Um, it's important to maintain your mouth mobility for oral hygiene and, of course, eating, and to maintain expression. You can use warm washcloths on your face prior to the exercises because we know that heat improves tissue elasticity, making the exercises a little bit more tolerable. Trunk, shoulder, elbow, cervical, spine stretches are important as well if you have more diffuse scleroderma and it's affecting more body parts. This is very, very important to continue to do this. Um, it's more important to maintain flexibility of all your joints by stretching and being active, active, active. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and uh, Lou brought along some exercise tools. We threw them in a bag, and maybe afterwards we can show you a little bit more about them. But the first one, you know, she's showing you the sport tubing up on the far right for you. Um, those are the ones with the handles and the tube. I think we forgot that. But we did cut some TheraBand, and you should be familiar with TheraBand. Um, most of these um, act, uh, sports tools and all are graded, meaning um, they get go from light to heavy. The normal grading system is yellow would be the easiest, the softest, and then it would go red, green, blue, black. So if you're out looking for something, you would probably want to start with the um, yellow or the red. I brought yellow and green so you could kind of feel the difference between the easiest to the medium. And I don't think I've ever used black. So um, overhead pulleys, we brought a sample of that, and we can show you that. But you can get a, a set of overhead pulleys for $5. Throw um, the latch on top, on the top of your door, and you can sit in a chair, and you can range your arms and shoulders beautifully. Because one arm pulls down, and the other arm goes up, and then you reverse it. Because you want to keep, you, you know, I know we're talking hands, but hands are connected. <laughs> <laughs> and so we want everything to stay as loose as possible. Um, we brought a foam roller yes, somewhere. Right, yep. We brought a foam roller, and we can show you some things maybe at the end of the talk if you're interested in some things you can do on a foam roller. These used to um, be a little hard to get. You had to go through a therapist, and now Target sells them. They're pretty common. Place, and yeah. They, yeah, they're pretty common. You can get online, too. But now that Target sells all this stuff, I think they sell the TheraBand, too. I'm not sure about the pulleys, but, um, uh, again, Amazon you can just search on overhead pulleys, you'll be fine. Dexterity activities, you do want to keep your digits just moving. And so and if you've got kids, grandkids, whatever, play games, um, use things, manipulate things, and stay busy. Shuffling cards. Oh, yeah, we love to shuffle mm -hmm. cards and throw out the poker chips in, in therapy. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm sorry, Lou. Ah. Oh, so skin ulcerations. Well, I think, obviously, prevention is key here. Um, again, avoiding those extreme temperatures, uh, keeping yourself warm, avoiding the trauma to the tips of the fingers. Um, I don't know if you guys are, are familiar with the digi sleeves, but these digi sleeves on the, on the bottom right-hand corner are 
tubular stockingettes, if you will, and they have a silicone. And so they're, they're nice for warmth, but they're also nice to protect the tips of your fingers from trauma. So we, and, the, and the compression also helps with the swelling as well. Um, so obviously all ulcers should be evaluated by your physician. Uh, we recommend that you don't start picking at some of your calcinosis and some of your ulcers because that way you're introducing bacteria and they become, become infected. So try to stay away from doing that. Um, all your dressings should obviously be applied in a sterile fashion and um, put on by, as advised by either your physician or your therapist. And, and I know some of you are wearing splints to cover some ulcerated areas, and uh, I think that's wonderful, and that's something that a, a therapist can do for you. I made one for Lou the other day. I, you can use a very thin fabric, and if your, your ulcers are healing well with a light dressing, fine, but if you find you're bumping your hand or you just keep irritating it, that's where something like a little splint made of plastic to cover over your light dressing and really protect it might aid in healing. So maybe later if you want to look at it, Luke can walk around with it because we, we make this kind of stuff all day long and it's fun stuff and it's something we can do for you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that one of the main thrusts of our talk here is talk, to talk to you about how to prevent things happening to your hands and how to protect your hands and how to reduce unnecessary force on your hands. We teach this stuff uh, all the time because it's also what we teach people with tendonitis. It's also what we teach pe people with arthritis, that if there is an appropriate tool for a, t a task, that you should use that tool and not use your hands. That's been a hard concept for me. I like to use my hands for a lot of things, but that's where you get yourself in trouble. And there are wonderful tools. Um, I gave you a catalog, and a little later I'm going to maybe um, refer to a couple things in that catalog, so you might want to flip the pages with me. But that's the um, Functional Solutions Catalog, and that will provide you with some adaptive quip equipment so that you're protecting your hands. And that's another thing a hand therapist can go through with you. If you go to the hand therapist and say, I have this one task in the kitchen that's just really difficult for me to do, we might know the right tool or the right technique to help you with that. Because we certainly want you to simplify your work. We want you to care for your hands so that they'll last for you as long as possible. And we want you to protect your hands, particularly those digits with fragile skin when you're working around the home or at your job. Um, the more you can protect them, maybe we don't have to worry about as many ulcerations and sequela. Uh, so when surgery is needed, uh, we um, utilize hand therapy post-operatively, and this usually begins with providing the, the dressings that the physician has recommended, and that could include um, anything from a wet to dry dressing, which means that it's a gauze soaked in a saline solution, it's applied directly to the wound, and then a dry uh, conforming gauze is then applied. That's often used when we want a little bit of debridement from the wound to kind of remove some of the necrotic tissue or scar or our scab rather. Um, splint fabrication is used for protection of, of the surgery and for positioning in that um, ideal position. And controlled range of motion and by controlled we mean within your pain tolerance. So our intent is not to stretch you to the point of agony it's working with you very closely in what you can tolerate, especially with your skin being rather fragile. So it's important to give that feedback to your therapist of, of what's comfortable for you. And then um, progression of upper extremity activity, which is basically progressing of, um, of performing your activities of daily living. There's really nothing better than getting your hand used back than using your hand in, in a normal fashion starting off with very light activities and then ramping yourself back up to what you normally do every day. And sometimes after these sympathectomies, you have some hypersensitivity hypersensitivity in your palm and so some of our therapy is just to help you desensitize that so it feels better to hold things, touch things. Um, that tissue hasn't been um, exposed for a little while after surgery and now we have to reintroduce um, touch and texture and we can teach you how to do that. Um, I think we already mentioned wound care but we, but hand hygiene is extremely important because you, you are touching your hand with your other hand and you are introducing um, 
possibly bacteria or something that could um, be detrimental. We do the wet to dry, as Lou mentioned, to kind of debride some of the area, but then there are times where we're just putting a little zero form or interface, a little protective barrier, and then gauze around it, and then possibly a splint on top it of it. Um, and that's all patient by patient. I, can, I couldn't tell you what would be the exact thing we would do. It's what you're responding to, what your needs are, and how frequent you, dre you change your dressings. We like them changed usually daily, sometimes twice a day, but certainly not letting them go long at all. Now, um, we're going to go back to a lot of the prevention stuff. I probably should have just done it with the slide, but we're, we're just going to conclude the slides and then start taking questions, and I'm going to show you some of the tools and things we brought along. But I put an orange sheet on everybody's table because I wanted you to know that um, there is a whole profession that is devoted to caring for your hands, and they're called certified hand therapists. Um, a certified hand therapist is either an occupational therapist, that's what we are, or a physical therapist that has advanced training on how to care for the hands. It's 4,000 hours of direct hand care, and it's taking a test, and it's, you know, it's, it's extra. So we know um, how to be um, the best we can be for the hand, and we're the ones that have um, extra expertise in splinting and making all the devices that you might need. So if you're seeing a physical therapist that's not a hand therapist, great. If they're keeping you mobile, great. But if you need some um, advanced care with your hands and you need some splints made and you need to understand how to protect your hands better, you may want to locate a certified hand therapist. And there's a wonderful website and the orange sheet gives you the directions and it's the same as what I put on the screen. So you can locate a, a certified hand therapist in your area. You do, however, have to have a doctor's referral uh -huh. uh, before we can start the therapy. So many of your primary care physicians are perfectly willing to write you a prescription for hand therapy as well, or your rheumatologist. Right. It doesn't have to be a hand surgeon. It can be any physician mm -hmm. just saying, um, please see my patient for hand rehab or an evaluation in care and splints as needed. So that's kind of the formal part of our presentation, and we'll, um, I'm going to go through, I think, some of the catalog items mm -hmm. and then field questions. But we do thank you for inviting us to be part of your um, meeting. This is my grandson, and Lou told me I could show a picture of him <laughs> because he is showing his hands to you, and it is, it is fascinating to watch all of us use our hands. So I'm going to put this... I'm going to put this here so my hands are free. Um, and I need a catalog. And, I, and I'd like to point out some of my um, pet instruments that I like to use and that I use at home. And Lou can add her two cents. But um, one of the things that I make sure is in everybody's kitchen, for my family and friends, is the jar pop on page 9. I don't think you should ever try to muscle a jar lid open. And even use some, using some of those jar opening tools are um, difficult on your hands. But the jar pop pops the seal of the jar lid and makes it super easy to get off. It's just a little plastic thing you throw in your utensil drawer. My husband uses it because um, he says, why should he mess up his hands? Mm -hmm. I've used it probably for at least 10 years. And so I recommend for a small investment that you get a jar pop. After you have then released the seal of the jar, now you take something sticky. And the sticky stuff is called Dysem, D-Y-C-E-M. And it comes in um, circular cutouts, or you can just buy a whole sheet of it. And if you buy a whole sheet of it, you can have pieces all different sizes. You can have small pieces cut for your water bottles. You can have big pieces cut for your jars. You can put it under a bowl that you're stirring so you don't have to hold the bowl so tightly. It was actually developed for the space industry, I think, back in the 60s. And it's neat stuff. It's called Dysem. Um, any of the adaptive scissors so that you're not pushing and pulling with your fingers and thumb, I would recommend. If you look at page 17, you see all the adaptive scissors. The, fis the fiskars are particularly good for uh, fabric, 
I actually have them all. I use the Fiskars for fabric. I use the OXO in the kitchen for some of the heavier things. And if you turn the page, you'll see the loop scissors on page 18. And that's what I use for paper, coupons, wrapping paper. Um, I never pull, well, I shouldn't say I never pull open a package with my hands. If I'm in my kitchen, I always get one of these pairs of scissors to use. If I'm out and about, I'm stuck pulling with my hands. But that amount of force, every time you pinch, is a lot of force on those fingertips. And if, in particular, your index or middle finger is tending to, to have more pain or um, have an ulcer, you want to be really careful with that. And that's where scissors come in handy. Um, getting fatter grips on your utensils, I would recommend too. You can do that with cylindrical foam. And we brought a couple examples of cylindrical foam. We use it to augment the size of our utensils, pens, things like that. We also use it for exercise. <laughs> and one of the reasons we brought it was to show you a couple of exercises, and we can do that. But you can also buy the OXO um, utensils, and they already have the foamy fat grips. And I have the knives. I have the potato peeler, and actually a pizza cutter is a really nice thing because it takes a lot of the force away from you because you can just roll. And it doesn't have to be for pizza. It can be for your brownies. It can be for a lot of other things. So those are kind of my pet instruments to use around your home that I think would really help protect your hands. The catalog um, is meant for all populations of people, so don't get concerned when you see the wheelchairs and walkers and commodes at the end. Um, it was just made for all patient populations. Does anybody, we'll field questions uh, about anything, but can I start with, does anybody have a question about an adaptive thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you asked about the paraffin. Actually, I meant it to say when we were looking at the paraffin that one of the um, easiest places to purchase it from is Bed Bath & Beyond. It's $39.99. Every time I go to Bed Bath & Beyond, I make sure they still have it. And you take your 20% off coupon, so you spend $32, and it comes with the wax. Now, when that wax runs out, you may want to use the wax in here, and we use the wintergreen scent. I really like it. Somebody, it wasn't you, right, Rachel? Just tried the lavender, and they said that was kind of funky. <laughs> um, but we use the wintergreen, and I really like it. There's no, I just think it smells yeah. nice. There, the, one's not better than the other. It's just a it, matter of personal preference. Yeah. My husband complains about the smell of the unscented wax in my home. When I plug it in, he says it smells kind of musty. I said it smells waxy. <laughs> but in our clinic, we're using the wintergreen, and nobody ever seems to notice that it's a bad odor. In fact, they really like that. So yeah. that's why I recommend that. Peach? Oh, does it? Okay. Okay. Right, that, that, that can happen. You know, another alternative, too, is to, um, you know, we've, we've had patients even bring them in. They make them. They make a little sack out of cotton, and they fill it with rice, and they put it in the microwave, and, and sometimes that's a little bit more tolerable. And they also, I think in that catalog, they do also have mitts that um, are thermal as well. That you, for arthri They were made for arthritis, but the same, same thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and my wax unit does have a little uh, dial on it, so it's got a keep warm function, but then it has uh, a notch below it. So you can turn down your wax unit um, a little bit, or a half an hour before you go to use it, you can take the lid off it, and that'll cool it down a little bit. So if you can't tolerate the 126 that it's set at, you could probably get it to a tolerable temperature for yourself if you want to use wax. Or, or you could wrap your hand in plastic first and then dip, which yeah, is... Or put a plastic glove on a... Yes. Yeah, right. like an exam glove on, put it on your hand, and then. Now you'll get the heat benefit. You won't get the oil benefit, though. Mm -hmm.
Uh, no, we haven't. We've, you know, in all the populations, uh, there are those who are very, very heat intolerant. And so, you know, if the person's a little bit skeptical about putting their hand in the paraffin, I'll usually say, well, I tell you what, why don't you try it with just one or two fingers from the non-injured hand in some situations and see if that's tolerable. Um, but we haven't had any, you know, major incidents, certainly no burns or anything like that. I, I sort of equate it with, you know, getting into a warm bath. Very seldom do you just jump right into it. You sort of put your toe in and then your ankle and get used to it, that kind of thing. I actually like paraffin because it's a, a controlled temperature. If I'm using a hot pack or I put something in a microwave, I'm not actually sure how hot that thing is. And I've seen more burns with hot packs and, and even the um, things heating we pads. throw, heating pads, mm -hmm. than the paraffin. Um, I've never seen a burn. You might be a little, it might feel a little too hot and be sensitive to you, but even with that, I've never seen anybody burned. Just tolerating it, yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. And when I um, dip in my wax unit, I always put a plastic bag over my hand afterwards. And then in our clinic, we wrap in a towel at home. I put my hand in a hot mitt, a, you know, a, a thing that I use it for um, taking oven. things out of the oven. So I just put my hand in an oven mitt, and then I can walk around the house and still do things with the hand that I haven't dipped in the wax. Mm -hmm. Can you use the carrots Yes. Mm hmm yeah, Especially if it's just yourself. In the clinic, we dispose of the paraffin, obviously, for hygiene reasons. So if you're just using it yourself, you can just dump it right back in again. Mm -hmm. And it'll last you a lot longer that way as well. We have TheraPutty. It's a medical-grade putty. I think, did we bring some here? Yeah, we can pass it around and... And this, again, comes in different strengths. It's color-coded, um, again, depending on the manufacturer, because there are different manufacturers, and their grading system of, of progression of strength is very different. But the one we use in our clinic is a very light blue, uh, least resistive, going all the way up to a, a fluorescent green that I can't even get out of the tub. That's for some of our construction workers kind of thing. So. But it's a, good, it's a useful tool. It's a, a good strengthening tool, and it helps with the mobility of the fingers as well. On Say that again. A writing tool. A writing yeah. tool. Yeah. I mean, I use Dr. Grip pens because they're fatter pens, and I use only gel ink because you don't have to press so hard. And I don't have scleroderma, but I have arthritis, and so I'm pretty careful um, with my writing tools. But you can just use the, the cylindrical foam as well. And this comes in different diameters, and if you find that the tool that you want to place in there, whether it be a toothbrush or a pen, if it doesn't fit in, you can make an incision in the foam, put the instrument in there, and then just tape it with some duct tape or masking tape or something like that. So we often say that people who have limited range of motion of the fingers think about increasing the diameter of the tool that you're using. So you're applying less stress and force to your hand, and it's going to be more helpful for you, even with grip. There are, there are much bigger foams than this than you can use if you have really limited grasp. Increase the diameter. If you have real se severity and limited range of motion, you want to increase the diameter of the tool that you're using. Oh, the little digi sleeves? Um, well, probably the easiest way would be to go to your hand therapist. But I've done internet searches on all that stuff. And if you just go to Amazon, you can find about anything. Um, I brought some some digital caps, too. And I, I did order these through a medical uh, supplier. But I did search them online for a patient, and he bought them off Amazon. So you can really, um, I, th I think, through that avenue, find about anything. And sometimes cheaper than what you might have to pay should you get them elsewhere. I have found that they are even too tight. getting loose ones, they, they cut off my circulation. Yeah, you have to be really careful. Well, my circulation got worse. Okay. Yeah. So that's something to be really careful about. Yeah, you do have to be really careful with anything circumferential. Um, and it's too bad because you, that, that 
um, silicon padding is really nice to yeah. use. Yeah. And um, did, but did you try the extra large? Yeah. I okay. Some on my toes and Just didn't work. It's yeah. 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 Yeah, I yeah, brought that. This, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Cheaper, yes. And, and I think that some of the product names are Silipad. That's one of, one of them. There's there's a number of them out there, but that's that's an excellent idea. Big sheet, right? And I know there was a woman earlier that mentioned that she had trouble with her cane, um, holding onto the cane that caused pain in her hand. One of the things that we'll do with a variety of our hand patients, if they're using walkers or canes, is we'll suggest that we build up the handle of the cane with a pressure-sensitive foam. It's called T-foam, much like the Tempur-Pedic beds. It has an adhesive backing strip. We just peel it off, wrap it around the handle of the walker or the cane, and that can be useful again in, in making that um, grip a little bit more comfortable. So, yes. Um, I got a steering wheel cover. Oh, steering wheel cover. Okay, good idea. Any other questions? Yes. You mentioned early on that you said about certification. Yes. Is that so insurance covers it or is it, that it's a requirement? It's, it's a legal requirement. As it stands now, we have to have a physician referral to treat a patient. But that, that may change in the near, near future. Um, but for right now, we have to have a, f a referral. So, so now it's a mandatory master's degree program. So wh when I went to school in the dark ages, it was a bachelor's degree program. So after, yeah, after you uh, obtain your master's degree, which is, you know, four or five years, and then it usually, it takes about five years to accumulate. No, the you can't even start your 4,000 hours until you, oh no, you ha can take your test after you've been five years as a yeah. registered therapist, and you can do your 4,000 hours anywhere in there, sorry. Right. Yeah. It, it has to be under the direction of a certified hand therapist. You have... It's similar. An yes. occupational therapist and a physical therapist have similar training. Mm -hmm. And then for an advanced certification in hand therapy, you can either be a physical therapist or an occupational therapist. Mm -hmm. So comparable. Does that answer it? Mm -hmm. Okay. I can't hear I you. I can't hear him. Should I pass the microphone? Yeah. Okay. okay. We, we have two of the microphones, but we, we can start sharing. My question was, are there any limitations of how many appointments you can have with a hand therapist during the course of 12 months or six months? That is pretty solely dependent on your insurance carrier. Mm 
and your insurance plan. Some plans will ha let you have unlimited visits. Those are the Cadillac plans. Most plans let you have 12 to 24 visits at therapy. If you're Medicare, um, you're under the Medicare cap, and that's usually, depending on what we all do, 15 to 18 visits a year. So you do have to be a little bit careful. Um, some of my patients have had the um, luxury of having an unlimited plan, but that's becoming rarer and rarer. So it's, it's dependent upon your insurance carrier. So would you say that um, you could still go, but you'd be out of your pocket? Well, oh, you, that's always the risk, yes. Yeah. But yeah, you can always pay out of pocket. Uh, you may not want to do that at Stanford. <laughs> we, we tend to be on the high end, but certainly you can. When I was in private practice, I had plenty of people come in and just use a credit card and, and, and pay per visit. I, I, well, I think at the very least, if you're starting to get some of those finger contractures, just going for a few visits to get splinting, if you haven't had them already, to use at night is probably a worthwhile investment. And just to get started on, on a, an exercise regime. And I don't think that takes, you know, months and months of therapy. I think you could get a lot accomplished in, in six, four to six treatments. Um. I, I have been lucky enough not to ever have a full-blown ulcer, but I have horrible calluses on my index, mostly on my index fingers and somewhat on my palms. And no cream or anything seems to do very much for it. I don't know if you have any ideas for that. Hmm. Well, I, I think you've probably tried it all, but I would say um, a, a thick lanolin-based cream with a glove over it at night. Uh huh. You've tried that? Actually, um, I, I haven't tried the glove over it. I so. put a glove over it at night and see if that helps. Um, the silicon product that we were just looking at, I'll bring one back to you and you can look at that and see okay. if that might help. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I have a whole stack of them. And I wear them at night, and uh, I keep them uh, in a lively way. Yeah. So, so, if you didn't hear, she said she ordered a lot of marching band gloves. They're cotton, and you can that you probably order dozens at a time. Um, bell ringing gloves, same way, and they have a little. Um, grip to them, so if you want to wear them while you're actually doing activities, they're pretty inexpensive too, but at least they have the um, little plastic grips on the fingers. And those are bell ringing gloves. What's yeah. The to, uh, to trap the moisture. But you have to put cream underneath? Mm hmm mm -hmm. You have to get rid of dryness or callus. But you want cotton because you, you don't want to over trap the moisture. I mean, the, the Silipost company does make a, an entire silicon glove kind of thing. But I, I haven't really used it, so I can't speak to that particular item. Can you take her the? Where are you pointing? Can you take her the microphone? She's got a question. I Here was, again? Oh, yeah. I was just going to say, at my worst, when I would get ulcers, you know, in three places on the same fingertip, and I would be going to the medical center a lot, I would bring my own soft bar soap because a lot of places have um, that alcohol drying mm -hmm. uh, stuff and even though that alcohol hand sanitizers. And so, I mean, I would just bring my own soft soap in a baggie and because if you go, you know, to a lot of places and use that alcohol stuff, that, that, that's really yeah. bad and it can dry it out so you begin an ulcer. So are there any hand sanitizers that aren't so drying? Oh. Well, they're, mo most of them are alcohol-based, so... Yeah. yeah, they um, put aloe in them, but yeah. they still have alcohol, right? Most of them have alcohol, because that's what, you know, uh, kills 99.9% .9 of the germs. So um, I, I prefer myself to be using a soap, something like a, a Neutrogena or Basis soap that has no added perfumes or chemicals. Um, I think that's probably a better idea. And the user and professional strength um, lotion is actually a very good lotion, and Neutrogena also does a hand, a Swiss hand cream, that is also very emollient as well. So, 
Hi, I just wanted some clarification on the night splint mm -hmm. as to when you can use it, when it's helpful. Because if the fingers already started to claw, whatever, mm -hmm. can the night splint help alleviate that in any way, or do you have to have surgery? No, I think you know, positioning your hand in that in that intrinsic plus position we talked about when you're starting to develop that tightness is always always a good idea. We, we can't stop the process of scleroderm as far as we know. It's certainly not going to hurt it in any way. You're putting the fingers in, on, in their maximum functional position, allowing these collateral ligaments to, to, to be in the right position so that we're not getting that clawing of the fingers. Will so. it reverse it in any way? Not likely but prevent it from getting any worse. And I notice like one of your fingers is worse than another, but that's the beauty of what we do because we take a straight piece of plastic and we heat it up and we mold it to your hand. So if you bought something over the counter, it wouldn't be able to fit the contours of each individual finger. If you've got a hand therapist making it, they can um, modify it to fit your fingers perfectly. Okay, does that make sense? Because we just throw this in 150 degree um, heated water and then we mold it to you. And so we can do about anything. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm wondering if you have any recommendations for healing ulcers over the pip joints, those kind of traumatic ulcers? You, say that again, you want strategies for healing them? For healing, protecting. Well, the caps, the, the cap splints that can be made, I think. Um, I made this for her DIP joint, but certainly you can make one just to cover the PIP joint. Mm -hmm. And you can cap them. We, we make these, uh, we call them dorsal splints, and we mold them to over the joint that's, um, ha that has the ulcer. Uh, first we put the dressing on it and then we mold the splint over it so that you don't keep, you know, hitting the knuckles that are sort of prone to the trauma to allow healing. And then it's very important to keep up with the dressing changes as well. <laughs> you have to hydrate your skin from top to bottom yeah. with a very good product, and we, especially with chlorine because that is very drying. I, I love you know aquatics and, and pool therapy for for everybody because of the the great benefits of that, not only aerobically but getting the stretches going on for all parts of the body. But you do have to hydrate your skin with a very good emollient afterwards. And, and some of the studies now say within you know five to ten minutes of getting out of the shower. I used to get out of the shower, dry off, do some things, and then hydrate before I got dressed, but now I'm trying to get that lotion on right away. So do it sooner than later. Any lotion? A any lotion, the, the thicker the better. Mm -hmm. Again, the Eucerin products are very good. Um, co the the co Palmer's cocoa butter that you can buy at Walgreens is very good. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? Okay. Um, I, I swim and I think it's very helpful to me. I always feel better afterwards. But after I swim, I do go on the sauna and that I think is also good for me. Would you think so? After what you say, it's going to take me longer to get the lotion on, but well, that, I am getting some steam. Right. The, and it's not so on the steam room. Oh, steam room. Okay. Steam room. Yeah, that's the only thing I worry about is just immersing yourself in water for too long because you know how we all get kind of wrinkly. Yeah, I don't stay and, in and, too long. But yeah, that, that should be fine. Okay, yeah. well, thank you for inviting us. Did they do? Did you guys want to go over any exercises? I know we have the handout that you had provided. 
I, I, I did go through all the oh, tendon did, gliding, okay. and then we talked about the stretch for the web spaces, the stretch for the thumb, and then you see on your sheet the walking of the fingers, and that's to help spread the web space as well, and use all your intrinsic muscles, and, um, and then just even individual finger flexion so that each tendon glides separately from another, because unfortunately when you have diffuse swelling or you have any autoimmune disorder going on in your hand, the hands not only want to stiffen up, they want to become one big big glob and you want to get each finger to be able to move separately and so I would really encourage that and the same thing happens with carpal tunnel syndrome and the same thing happens with arthritis so I sit around and do this a lot and just get each individual finger moving so that they they um, maintain their mobility as much as possible. stretch on this by putting it down on the ground and putting your back, your neck needs to be supported your on the spine. cervical, yeah, your spine and your neck, bend your knees, and you just let your shoulders sort of flop back over the sides of the foam to get a good opening and pectoral stretch. But we also use this for people who have shoulder restrictions as well. So you can set it on a table and you can roll it forward along the table to get a shoulder stretch this way. That's also very useful. And then out to the side as well, if you have some abduction problems with your shoulder as well, this is a nice way to do it. So again, a very useful uh, tool. People, will, uh, often athletes, will stretch their IT bands with this particular foam. I suggest uh, for the scleroderma patients to probably consider buying a foam roller that has the true foam and not the styrofoam, because this is somewhat abrasive to the skin. So. No, I know what you're asking, and, and I prefer, and this is what we do in our clinic, we heat first with either paraffin, hot pack, whatever, so you heat first. We do light passive range, which is you pushing with your other hand or a therapist pushing, again, to your tolerance, and that's where I mentioned the 15 to 30 second hold. If somebody's just pushing you down and letting you just kind of bounce back up and react, you're not going to get that nice prolonged stretch. So you want to push down and hold for 15 to 30 seconds. And after you've done some of that passive range, then you do your active. So passive is you using your other hand or somebody else doing a little push or stretch, and then active is what you're doing with your own muscle. And if you're starting to feel really sore, you might be doing too much active and you might want to revert to a little more passive because the active is going to pull those tendons through the, um, the tendon sheath. And sometimes people start getting a little clicking or triggering in their fingers. And then you just have to back off a little bit and do a little more passive. Yeah, I've started taking off my rings at night just so I don't have to deal with that. Yeah. The most important solution for my wife for her wedding ring. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you all have heard of it or this, but I was amazed to see they have a wedding ring now that opens. Yes. My, my, oh, you haven't seen that? And, and you can buy them that way. You can take any existing ring to a jeweler and have it put in. And usually to open it, you need like a, a, the top of a pen or a little, uh, you open up a paper clip and you just put it right in there and then it pops open. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, Susan, Brooke, thank you so much. Please accept these certificates of appreciation. Oh, thank, thank you very much, ladies. Really appreciate it. Yeah. We appreciate being here.